Game of Thrones is currently the biggest and most expensive television series in the world. It's an epic medieval fantasy which mixes bloody family feuds with Tolkien-style swords and sorcery and apocalyptic battles with giants, dragons and the undead. But behind a lavishly shot spectacle is an addictive story of ambition, greed, lust, treachery and the pursuit of power. With its multiple storylines, complex characterization and graphic sex and violence, this is state-of-the-art television with a global following in over 180 countries. It's based on a series of novels by the American author George R. R. Martin, and the books have so far sold 58 million copies. The South Bank Show went to America to talk to George R. R. Martin about his writing from the beginning until Game of Thrones. Although the imaginary medieval world of Game of Thrones is loosely based on episodes from European history, it was dreamed up in the new Mexican city of Santa Fe, where Martin has lived since the 1970s. Despite his success, Martin still lives in a relatively modest suburban home, but he's bought the house across the road as a study, library, and trophy room. Welcome to Santa Fe and the land of enchantment and my library study. I, I bought a house uh, down the street, so uh, I won't have to work at home anymore. My wife liked that because now I actually have to put on some clothes instead of just uh, going down in my bathrobe and working all day. And here, of course, is Robbie the Robot from my favorite science fiction film, Forbidden Planet. And also we have here my collection of miniature figurines, toy soldiers. We have the whole cast of Game of Thrones here, Hodor and Bran, and Robert, Tywin, this is Sansa building the snow castle. Up there, there's a miniature me uh, surrounded by semi-naked uh, female figures. <laughs> I never dreamed I would have this kind of mega global success. And it's pretty overwhelming. It's pretty overwhelming, but it's something that you you could never have dreamed of and certainly never realistically expected. It's It's catching lightning in a bottle. George Martin comes from humble origins. He was born in 1948 in Bayonne, New Jersey. His father was a dock worker, and the family lived in a low-income housing project by the water. I do think some of my desire to write and some of my desire to read was motivated by um, the limits of the life that I led. We didn't have much money to spend. Uh, we didn't own a car. My school was on Fifth Street. I walked to it, and that was for all intents and purposes, that was my world. My world was five blocks long. From an early age, George was aware of a lost fortune on his mother's side of the family, the Brady family, who once owned a successful construction business, a dock, and a grand house, all lost in the Great Depression of 1929. But I had to walk past that house every day on my way from the projects on First Street to Fifth Street, and it's like, well, that used to be our dock. That used to be our house. Now we don't have a house. We don't have a yard. But I had always had this sense of, yeah, I'm poor, but I come from, like, royalty. Or I come from greatness that somehow was destroyed by the depression, by corrupt politicians, by things like that. So maybe that gives me a little of the uh, emotional temperament to understand somebody like Daenerys Targaryen. What is it you want? My birthright. The Seven Kingdoms of Westeros. I'm sorry, little princess. I am not your little princess. I am Daenerys Stormborn of the blood of Old Valyria, and I will take what is mine. With fire and blood, I will take it. Other kids had cars, and they got out of town. Um, you know, they took summer vacations down the shore or in the, in the mountains. We couldn't afford to do any of that. We just stayed in the same old apartment in the summer. And I dreamed of being on other planets and living in other times. And I was a lonely kid. I was the kid with his nose in the book. Um, I was the last kid picked for games or things like that. I didn't, you know, sports. I was, was no good at sports. So I spent a lot of time, uh, you know, sitting, reading, reading a comic book, reading a science fiction book. Most of my initial exposure to many of the great works of uh, English literature was through the Classics Illustrated comic books, whether it was you know, the Time Machine and War of the Worlds to at best Catholics Illustrated or Shakespeare. They did Shakespeare, you know, Hamlet as a comic book. 
But then I discovered Superman and Batman, and they were much cooler. So I was reading all the all the superhero comic books. So I think it was really comic books that made me interested in reading and in stories and in heroes. As a schoolboy, George Martin was writing superhero and science fiction stories for himself, his friends, and for comic fanzines. He still has some of the figurines which inspired those stories. These are some of my first characters. Most of these are aliens made in the United States in the 1950s and sold in five and dime stores. They have no stories, so I made up stories for them, and this is some of my earliest writing. But I decided that these were a gang of space pirates. This guy uh, was from Mars, Jarn. I decided his name was, he was the chief pirate. He was the head of the pirates. And this guy, who was supposedly from Orion, I couldn't figure out this weapon he was holding. It looked like a drill to me, this weird little weapon. So I decided he was the pirate torturer. He would use that drill to drill into your knees or your head and get you to spill your secrets. I was a bloodthirsty little kid even then. But the black and white comic book world of aliens and monsters, superheroes and villains collided with reality when George went to college in Illinois in 1968 to study journalism. This was the height of the Vietnam War and George had to rethink his worldview. I had come from Bayonne, and you know, Bayonne was blue collar and very patriotic, and you know, the United States can do no wrong, and and uh, etc. But college was an education for me. I remember being assigned to do a paper to to uh, research the Vietnam War, which before that I had just thought about. Well, it's we're in another war, and we're helping poor people defend themselves against evil communist aggression. And then I actually researched the war and the role of the French, and you know, the complexity and the rigged elections, and, you know, suddenly it didn't look at all so clear-cut to me anymore. And I gradually uh, got radicalized, I suppose you would say. While still a student, George sold his first story, which appeared in the science fiction magazine Galaxy in 1971. The hero is a tale of a battle-weary soldier fighting on a distant planet who wants to retire and return to Earth. That was definitely an anti-war story and an, an anti-militarization uh, story. It was actually triggered by people coming back from Vietnam, particularly Green Berets and all that, who had been trained to respond violently to any, any kind of threat, and, and they had a hard time turning this off in civilian life. Well, what if you have, a, you have someone who's a soldier like that in the future, and he's, you know, he's this killing machine. He's this highly decorated killing machine, and now he wants to go back to civilian life. How do you make him not a killing machine? A couple years later, when I was called up to be drafted, I applied for conscientious objector status. One of the supporting documents I submitted was that story, which was like a couple years before, so it, it clearly showed anti-military and anti-war sentiments you know, two years before my application and, and perhaps gave my application a little more credence, so my draft board did give me conscientious objector status. Despite taking an anti-war stance over Vietnam, George Martin has constantly returned to warfare as a theme in his fiction. War is an important subject. It, it's there. It's all through human history. I mean, you go back and, and you read history. I've studied history all my life. I've read history. What is history? History is war. History is the history of war, you know, the Romans versus the Carthaginians, the, the Greeks versus the Persians, the wars of the Italian city-states during the Renaissance, the Hundred Years' War, the, uh, you know, the American Revolution, the British Revolution, the French Revolution. Uh, it's all wars and, and violence. It's, it's the most important subject. Look at me. Stannis is a killer. The Lannisters are killers. Your father was a killer. Your brother is a killer. Your sons will be killers someday. No elders built by killers. So you better get used to looking at them. Game of Thrones is set during a bloody civil war and it portrays war in all its brutality. Epic fantasy is universally about wars. I mean, Tolkien, and uh, even before Tolkien, E.R. Edison, the heart of epic fantasy always seems to be some great war or another. <laughs> 
And to some extent, I, I think I'm in dialogue as I write about war with other fantasists who have gone before me and, and uh, even my contemporaries. But unlike most writers of epic fantasy, Martin depicts war as horrific and largely futile rather than heroic. It's a complicated issue here. I'm not a complete pacifist. If you believe in war under any circumstances, then you have to say you'd fight in World War II. I, come on, the Nazis were the closest thing that the human race has ever reached to orcs. Um, if, the, if the Nazis had not existed and we invented them for a fantasy novel, people would say, oh, you're, come on, you're going over the top. This is ridiculous, you know? They're, they're cooking people in ovens. They wear all black uniforms. They have skulls on their, on their hats. Come on, this is too much. But that's the reality of the situation. But if you look past World War II, I mean, look at World War I. My God, what a colossal waste of millions of human lives. What was World War I all about? Why did anyone fight in World War I, you know? Why did, why did anyone fight in the War of Jenkins' Ear, the War of the Three Henrys? You go back and you look at these thousands of years of wars and what caused them and you know, most of the time, it just doesn't seem worth it. George's route to epic fantasy was through a different literary genre. In the 1970s, he was building his career as a science fiction writer. This was a time when the Apollo moon landings were turning science fiction into science fact. When I was really young, I wanted to be an astronaut and go to the moon and walk on Mars. I used to wonder, would I live long enough to see men walk on the moon? And then, by the time I was in college, I saw a man walk on the moon. But I never dreamed that I would see men stop walking on the moon. It was great, you know, but it was also... Sometimes when a dream comes true, it's not as cool as the dream. Martin started to have success with short stories which used space travel and life on other planets as a way of exploring themes of existential loneliness. He traveled to science fiction conventions around the country and shared ideas with fellow writers like his friend Lisa Tuttle. George is in that kind of cohort, I guess, of writers who were serious about what they were doing, loved science fiction, loved comics and movies and making up stories set in outer space and thinking about things that didn't happen in, in this world. But at the same time, they were putting real emotion into it. One of the uh, big voices in those days was Harlan Ellison. Harlan was always talking about the necessity of writing from the gut, of bleeding onto the page, of, you know, digging deep and, and you know, getting to powerful emotional material. That was the stuff. And that, I took that uh, heart, I said to myself, I need to write some, some stories that expose my vulnerabilities, that, that hurt in some sense, that, that uh, where I'm, I'm getting at some truths is the way I, I see and experience the world. Martin started to win awards for his stories and went on to write a series of successful novels which reworked popular genres. He did not write the same book twice. He would write a huge, thick, beautiful... Um, space opera set on a dying planet and then suddenly you're you're reading a riverboat novel um and suddenly there's vampires happening and he's a different kind of writer and it became obvious that george was a writer who wanted to try everything i think genre is just a matter of furniture the furniture doesn't matter the human heart can be in conflict with itself in a story that takes place in a castle and that has dragons in it, and it can happen on a spaceship 10,000 years in the future, um, or it can happen in a suburban setting or in the streets of Bayonne, New Jersey. To my mind, it always comes back to the human heart in conflict with itself, what Faulkner said. That is the only thing worth writing about, and that's the thing I always try to write about regardless of what the, what the setting is. But when George's fourth novel, The Armageddon Rag, was a commercial failure, he was forced to find work as a writer in television. My not career as a novelist appeared to be over after that book. I, I couldn't sell my fifth novel. In 1986, he secured a job on the relaunched classic science fiction series, The Twilight Zone. Writing short stories and novels is a lonely experience. 
going out to Hollywood, uh, you know, suddenly you're you're part of a staff of writers, and and you're taking coffee breaks with them, and you're saying, here's the stuff I'm writing, and they're telling you what they're writing, and you're kicking around ideas, and you have a secretary to make coffee for you, and you watch dailies together of the show that's uh, that that you know somebody wrote yesterday, and you're visiting a set and visiting with actors, and of course you're having meetings with the network and the studio, and and uh, you're going to premieres, and it, you're you're part of this larger world. Working as a writer in Hollywood was lucrative, but George found that writing for television had creative limitations. You write science fiction fantasy, you don't have to worry about budget. You're, you know, you can put anything you want on the page and the reader's imagination supplies the rest. But when I was writing for Twilight Zone and Beauty and the Beast, and you know, I was constantly getting notes, you know, George, we, we love this, this is terrific, but it's five times our budget, so can you please cut three of these matte paintings, and gosh, you have 27 characters in this thing, could we have six? And uh, this big client battle at the end where two armies of 100,000 people are fighting, could that be a duel between the hero and the villains? That would be good. In one episode of The Twilight Zone, loosely based on the King Arthur legend, George was told he could either have Stonehenge or horses, but not both. It's easy to see how his vision was restricted by the budget. Demon heart. Oh, stop it, you old goat! The great side about working for Hollywood television is you are part of a collaborative medium. The bad side, you're part of a collaborative medium. <laughs> And all these other people have their own ideas. They, they want to change this, they want to change that, or you should rewrite it, the sponsor doesn't like it, uh, the network doesn't like it, censors say this, standards and practices, and that kind of stuff can drive you crazy. And, uh, and it did drive me crazy after a certain amount of time. You know, I could take it for a while, but at the end it wore me down. In 1991, frustrated by Hollywood, George decided to go back to writing novels where no one could interfere with his creative vision. And I started actually writing a science fiction novel that had been an idea I'd been playing with a long time, a book called Avalon. And I was working on Avalon and it was coming pretty well. Um, and suddenly the first chapter of Game of Thrones came to me, where they find the dire wolf pups. I knew it wasn't part of the science fiction novel I was writing. This was clearly a fantasy, medieval, had these wolves in this large family. I'd been reading a lot of historical fiction and it might have been in the back of my mind, but suddenly it all gelled and I, I wrote in, I wrote that chapter in like two, three days. It just came to pour out of me. When I did return to books, I said to myself, okay, uh, I've, I've had many things option, they never make them. I've done pilots and TV shows, tried to keep them within budget and producible, they never make that. I'm tired of playing that game. I'm gonna, you know, I have a big imagination. I have an epic story I want to tell. I'm gonna make it as big as my imagination. I'm gonna have all the, the castles and battles I want. I'm gonna have hundreds of characters because the real world is complex. I want my fictional world to be complex too, not a kind of simplified thing. I want to have giant battles. I want to have incredible castles that each one is distinct from the other that people remember for all time. I want to have dragons and dire wolves and mammoths and a wall of ice that's 700 feet tall. I want something huge and epic that can stand up there with Tolkien. In 1991, disillusioned with Hollywood, George R. R. Martin embarked on a series of epic fantasy novels called A Song of Ice and Fire, which has now reached book five of a projected seven volumes. Loosely based on the Wars of the Roses, it chronicles a bloody civil war in which rival families are fighting for the iron throne of the seven kingdoms of Westeros. Martin's ambition was to create a fantasy world as rich as Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. When you look at something like Lord of the Rings, you're, you, you are immensely impressed by the, the depth of the world building. And encountering all those appendices at the end of Return of the King, and you, you see how much material he has put into it. A lot of fantasy takes its lead from, from Tolkien, who himself was, was drawing from older medieval myths and, and tradition. But most of the people who followed Tolkien, including me, were faking it. I mean, Tolkien was the proverbial iceberg where, you know, nine-tenths of the structure is below the water. I mean, my iceberg when I started out was some ice piled on a raft. So it gave the illusion of being an iceberg, but there was nothing below the surface. 
From the first germ of an idea, George had to build an enormous parallel world, complete with fictional histories, religions, and languages. As you write the books, as you tell the stories, you need to start creating things, you know? So I'm, I'm writing those, that first Game of Thrones thing, and, you know, I'm like 50 pages into it. I say, well, I, I, better, I better have a map. You know, I'm, where's the king coming from? What's the name of the city? And what are, I, how far has he come? And I better design a map. And then at a certain point, we're referring to the Targaryens. I said, I better, how many Targaryens were there? I better, so I'm, so I'm not contradicting myself. I better make up a list of kings. You know, then I started making up names and numbers at first. That's all it was. It was just Aegon the first, uh, you know, one, two, 37 or whatever, and then his son, and then the next son, and a list of names and numbers. You add a detail here, you add a detail there, and, and uh, suddenly the world is growing right alongside of your story. The world of Westeros, on one level, is a kind of alternate England in the Wars of the Roses. The map looks kind of similar to, uh, to England. Um, the politics uh, is reminiscent of the 15th century, the fairly obvious starting point is Stark and Lannister, York and Lancaster. But once you start to unpick the story, you see that there's history from, I mean, just about everywhere. Uh, Roman history, history of the Crusades. You know, you look up at, at the wall in the north, I think that's pretty obviously a version of Hadrian's Wall. Um, you could look at uh, Daenerys across the sea and you could see her as a kind of Cleopatra or an Amazon warrior. You've got uh, visions of Greek history, you've got visions of uh, South American history, ancient history, uh, modern history, all of this piled into the same world, they're kind of given a stir, and then on top of that, you've got this fantasy element as well. And all of this combines to create a sort of historical fantasy alternative world, but that is very, very much of its own. I always loved history. and. European history more than American history for some reason. American history was fine, you know, Civil War, World War II, Revolution, all that stuff. But there, there was something that made me more attached to the Kings of England and the Hundred Years' War and the Crusades. I mean, that, that uh, evoked my imagination. For some of his leading characters, George borrowed attributes from the real kings and queens of England. Edward I uh, considered one of the great kings of England, but you know, the more you read about him, you know, the Hammer of the Scots, Longshanks, you know, the Conqueror of Wales. This is a brutal, savage man. Edward II considered a horrible king, probably the worst in English history. He liked to hang out with the common people. He didn't like jousting and swordplay. What he liked, he liked carpentry and he, he, roofing, thatching roofs. That was his hobby. And he, he hung out with carpenters and, and masons and liked to learn about their building techniques. We would consider a guy like that a pretty cool guy, but it was just unthinkable at, at those times. There are times I'd like to be the king of the world because I could, you know, do a few things. But uh, most of the time, I'm glad I'm not because, boy, that's a tough job. And being the king of anywhere is a tough job, but I like to get at that and make the readers think about it. When you look at a character like Joffrey, you see uh, a caricature of the dreadful uh, child king, but in a very specific sense, what I see is a lot of Richard II, the king who saw off the peasants of revolt, but really a vicious, horrible, power-crazed young man who, who turned out very, very badly indeed. <laughs> Well, what constitutes a good king? You know, to what extent do you do you want to be harsh with your people? To what extent do you want to be merciful? Uh, where does justice come into it? You know, Machiavelli had his views, Hobbes had his views. I mean, this is a fascinating debate and one that's as, uh, just as timely in 2015 as it is in 1315. I've got seven kingdoms to rule. One king, seven kingdoms. Do you think honor keeps them in line? Do you think it's honor that's keeping the peace? It's fear, fear and blood. He's not writing his stories as a historian would write them. You are right down there on the ground experiencing them, looking out through people's eyes, walking there with them and caring about them. And the moment you do that, you're lost because you have to care.
One of the things that sets George Martin's fantasy world apart from other writers is its moral complexity. You are no knight. You have forsaken every vow you ever took. So many vows. They make you swear and swear. Defend the king, obey the king. Obey your father, protect the innocent, defend the weak. And what if your father despises the king? What if the king massacres the innocent? It's too much. No matter what you do, you're forsaking one vow or another. You know, there's a lot of fantasy that concerns itself with the battle of good and evil. And I think the battle of good and evil is a, is a terrific subject for fiction. But I don't think it's, it's fought between really good-looking guys in white cloaks on white horses and really ugly guys in black armor who smell bad, as in too much fantasy. I, I think it's fought within the individual human heart. I've always been attracted to gray characters. That's what I try to write, because I think those are real characters. Those are real human, real human beings. Game of Thrones is written entirely in a series of extremely tight, third-person viewpoints. So I'm not using first-person, but uh, I'm still focused. Each chapter has the name of an individual character, be it Tyrion, Arya, Ned, whoever it is. And during that chapter, you're, you're inside his head. You know, I, I never go omniscient. So you're only seeing the things that he sees. You're hearing the things he hears. If something is happening in the next room or even behind his back, he's not necessarily aware of them. So you're not aware of them as the reader and you're hearing the thoughts of that character. One of the most intriguing characters George has created is Tyrion the Dwarf. He is disadvantaged, he is a dwarf, he is despised by his father and his sister. You are an ill-made, spiteful little creature, full of envy, lust, and low cunning. He does have some advantages. He has a great family name, he has wealth, but, um, He's also despised largely by the public. Is this person a monster? Is this person a hero? Is, is this person is a human being. They're both. The golden boy, the character who can have everything and do everything, and is, you know, the superhero, to my mind, is less interesting. The golden boy of Westeros is Jamie Lannister. He's the guy who has it all. He comes from the most powerful family, he's the greatest swordsman in the land, he's incredibly handsome. I think where the perception of Jamie really changes is suddenly when we're in Jamie's point of view. Now we're seeing the world as he sees it, we're hearing his thoughts, not just the words that he speaks, but uh, the things he doesn't say, the things he's reluctant to say, his feelings that he keeps hidden. When Jamie has his hand cut off, George manages to make us feel sympathy for this incestuous child murderer. Suddenly, in, in a stroke, he's, he's crippled, he's damaged, and we discover that there are reasons for some of the things he did, and we discover his, his doubts and his failings and his temptations and his justifications, and all of that helps to, helps to humanize him. George has also created a number of complex female characters struggling to survive in a brutal male world. It has also been criticized for portraying women as too subservient to men's desires. Well, women's options in the world of Westeros, and particularly the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros, are relatively limited, as they were, again, for, for much of Western history. You know, Western history is very long. You know, women had one role in ancient Greece, and even there, it was different in Sparta than it was in Athens. And you know, then the Macedonians had, were still different, and then the Romans came in and they had. And so it's always changing. Um, and the Middle Ages itself is a thousand years long, from you know the fall of Rome to the Renaissance. And during that thousand years, there were great differences according to country and according to time, in the status accorded to women. Medicine was not far advanced. There were a tremendous amount of women who died in childbirth. Highborn women had, had more advantages, but in some ways also more disadvantages. They were more likely to be sold off for a political marriage. And, you know, uh, oh, good, I have a daughter. I can marry him, you know, my 12-year-old daughter to the 75-year-old guy in the next county and hopefully get his land. Middle Ages were not a kindly time for women. Now, that's not to say that it was true of all women. There were certainly powerful women and charismatic women. But nonetheless, it was... These, these were not egalitarian centuries. <laughs> the fate of George's characters and the moral choices they make 
has provoked huge online debate among George's readers. The fact that there are such vigorous debates going on there is it, an indication to me that I'm doing doing something right. You know, when when people are debating vigorously about whether a character is a good person or a bad person, that shows you created a real character, because then they're debating about that person the same way we in real life debate about President Obama or Winston Churchill or Neville Chamberlain or you know real characters from history or from the current world. And, you know, if if everybody thinks your character is a hero or everybody thinks your character is a villain, then you're writing cardboard. George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire was launched as a TV series Game of Thrones in 2011. It's currently the biggest and most expensive television series in the world. George likes to host free marathon screenings of the series at the cinema in Santa Fe, which he recently bought to save from closure. This is just good storytelling. It is. <laughs> it is everything horrible about humanity that we're not supposed to enjoy, but really is kind of enjoyable to watch. <laughs> it's a fantasy world that's true yeah. to life. It's really uh, true to the human spirit. He's sort of the dire wolf representative in the real world here. I think it's a wonderful political allegory. I think it's absolutely about the misuse of power. And uh, I also love it because I love Mr. Martin. He's been a great citizen here. He's given us a lot. I love old movie theaters. For me, that's part of the experience of, of going to a film. Um, I know the generation coming up likes to get Netflix and watch them on their cell phones, but for me, that's not the experience. I want to I want to see my movies on a big screen in a movie theater and uh, with a crowd around me uh, sitting in the dark and ideally with some buttered popcorn and, uh, and a soft drink. You know, I'm a big fan of television and film, but I, I never thought A Song of Ice and Fire could be done when I was starting it out, I, and it was almost deliberate. But when Peter Jackson adapted the Lord of the Rings trilogy for the big screen, he demonstrated that epic fantasy could be brought to life using modern cinematic techniques and digital wizardry. The films were a massive global hit. And Hollywood is basically imitative, so, you know, if a movie about a clown does well, everybody wants a movie about a clown. Epic fantasy had done well, suddenly every studio in Hollywood was looking for their own Lord of the Rings. George received a lot of offers to turn his books into a movie, but they all wanted to simplify the story. It took Peter Jackson three movies to make Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. He still had to cut things. It would take three movies for Long Storm of Swords alone. And if you figure like two movies for Game of Thrones and two movies for Clash of Kings, you're already, you're already up to seven movies and, and you're halfway through the series. Nobody's going to commit to that. And of course they wouldn't commit to that. The people I met with for movies said one of two things. They either said, oh, oh we'll, we'll just make the first movie and then after that's a hit, then we'll make more. Well, of course, if you go down that route, then you have Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials. Great fantasy. They made the first movie. Didn't do as well as they expected. You'll never see the second movie. You'll never see the third movie. So I didn't like the idea of that broken kind of series. Or alternatively, they said, well, we have to find, yes, it's true, it's too complex, it's too big the way it is, but we have to find the, uh, the, the central arc. And we've decided the central arc is Jon Snow. The whole movie will be about Jon Snow. Or... The central arc is Daenerys. The whole movie will be about this exiled princess, and she gives birth to dragons, and that's that's what your movie is about. I said, well, that, that might be a good movie. That would be interesting, but it wouldn't be my story. My story is a combination of stuff. And I was in a fortunate position because, you know, I'd worked in Hollywood. I, I didn't live an extravagant lifestyle. I'd saved my money. I'd paid off my debts. And now I had a best-selling series that was bringing in a lot of money. I didn't need the money. So I could had the power to say the sexiest word in Hollywood, no. No, thanks. Appreciate the offer, but nah, I don't, don't think we want to do it. But George's books found their way into the hands of two young producers who had something different in mind. I started reading and, and uh, uh, got to the scene where Bran is pushed out the window and I thought, oh, I didn't, I didn't see that coming. And uh, got a few hundred pages more into it and called Dan, um, who was an old friend, and we went to graduate school together, and I knew that he also grew up reading fantasy, and 
and said, I, I might be losing my mind, but I think this is the most fun I've had reading a book in, a, in, in as long as I can remember. He brought us back to that experience of compulsive reading that we had when we were, were kids, where you would sit in a comfortable chair for eight hours, read two, three hundred pages in a sitting, by kind of grafting adult psychological reality onto a genre that was so formative for us. So it was a, it was a potent combination that he, that he pulled off so deftly and, you know, not just once, but again and again and again. Benioff and Weiss saw the potential to turn George's novels not into a film, but into a television series for the groundbreaking American cable channel, HBO. What he does with his genre is very similar to what HBO has been doing to the genres, uh, with the gangster genre, the Western, or the history, and, and the cop show. Like, it's what they've been doing for years. It's the shows that they made that have kind of ushered in the golden age of, of television. Books is full of sex, they're full of battles, they're full of violence, uh, none of which is ever going to get past the network censors. HBO was definitely the place to be. I mean, The Sopranos, Deadwood, Rome, you know, incredible shows, dark shows, powerful shows, shows with violence, social shows with sexuality. They would get behind the project and they would give it a solid commitment. We'd never produced anything for television before. We'd never produced anything for film or internet or, or anything. We'd written before, but we never produced. So when we went to George, probably it was kind of like, it was probably like that bluff where you mistakenly think you have a straight and you actually don't. But we were so confident <laughs> that, that I think we convinced George that, well, these guys seem like they really know what they're doing. I said, I want, it done. I want a faithful adaptation of the books. And they said, that's what we want to do. And we had just a great lunch. We talked for hours to lunch turned into dinner. George tested Benioff and Weiss's knowledge of his books with an obscure question about the character of Jon Snow. And he got this sort of, you know, shrewd look on his face and he said, um, so who is Jon Snow's mother? And oddly, luckily, Dan and I had been talking about this the night before and we didn't know, but we had theory about it. So we kind of looked at each other and then one of us said uh, the answer that we thought. And he didn't say yes or no, but he got this little smile. And then, you know, the next we heard was George has approved your, you know, your bid or whatever you call it. So at the end of it, I said, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. Go take it, go take it into HBO and run with it. Game of Thrones is now the most popular and the most expensive television series in the world. It has a cast of thousands and is filmed on location in Iceland, Spain, Malta, Croatia, and Northern Ireland. George R. R. Martin's vision has a global appeal. I don't know whether George is channeling the zeitgeist or George has changed the zeitgeist, but I think it's very true. He's a part of the reason the, book, the books and the series have become so popular. It obviously speaks to the way a lot of people feel. We've talked to people from Russia, people from Brazil, people certainly in, in the, the States, and you hear, it's really, it's like Game of Thrones here. It's like the government is just like Game of Thrones, and I've heard that applied to uh, Putin, I've heard it applied to Assad in Syria, I've heard it applied to, you know, Republican politicians here, and it's just, uh, it's just everywhere. But there's a problem now. The TV series has caught up with the novels and George is nowhere near finishing the sixth volume. Luckily, we've had a lot of talks with George about where he's going. We know the end point, and we're hoping that, um, you know, that end point will be uh, very much in keeping with the spirit of the books. My very first... <laughs> Deadline on Game of Thrones, I blew fairly spectacularly, and I've been blowing every deadline I've been given ever since. There's always nine more things to do. There's always pressure to uh, write the next script or finish the next season or go on a promotional tour, and uh, it, it, uh, it keeps me busy. Fans of George's books have been getting increasingly impatient. Websites and blogs have appeared angrily demanding that he hurries up and completes the series. As early as 2009, his friend and fellow writer Neil Gaiman famously came to his defense. I told the world, George R. R. Martin is not your bitch. And it turned up, much to my surprise, on T-shirts, on badges. Somebody even wrote a George R. R. Martin is not your bitch song. Your deal with that author when you buy his book is not that he will spend every waking moment of his life writing another book for you to read. I'll deal with you as an implicit one, and it is that the book 
that you bought will be a good book. I've given up making predictions as to when I'm going to finish it because every time I do, I'm wrong and, you know, then everybody gets all bent out of shape about it. I'm writing The Winds of Winter, which is book six in the series, and I hope the next to last book, uh, the last book will be A Dream of Spring. Once those are done, then I can take a rest and enjoy a few of the accolades and the fruits of success that have accumulated to me and then go back to writing something or other. And I'll be a different person then and the world will have changed and I'll see what I feel like writing in whatever year that happens to be. I should be doing that right now. You're <laughs> interfering with me. <laughs> I'm sure this book will be a year late just because of you. <laughs>